So I recently traveled to Ireland, home of green fields, cloudy skies, pasty skin, and very, very old buildings. From Neolithic tombs called dolmen like this one named Polnabron, dates back to over 6,000 years, to tower houses that would display the wealth and opulence of Celtic chieftains, everywhere you look are reminders that as long as there have been humans, we've been building buildings. And it's only in the last hundred years or so that we've used electricity to heat and cool these buildings. So there's only two options. One, that humans were miserably uncomfortable for thousands of years up until very, very recently in our history. Or two, they found ways to build their homes so that they could be comfortable without electricity. I don't think the first one is true. Yes, we have a lot more comforts than we used to, but I think that the human desire for comfort probably existed before electricity. So how did they do it? How did they build for comfort without using any electrical or mechanical means? And in a day and age with temperatures higher than ever and our grids are tested to the breaking point, what can we learn from that? By the way, the worst power outage in U.S. history was the Northeast blackout in 1965. It prompted new federal regulations that ensured the nation's power grid would be reliable. But in Texas, it's run by ERCOT. ERCOT stands for the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, which sounds sarcastic to even say right now. Not to be confused with EPCOT. EPCOT's a totally different thing. ERCOT was formed in 1970, and it manages the Texas power grid uh, beyond the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's jurisdiction. Now, not all of Texas falls under ERCOT's control. There are some parts that are on the national grid, but for the most part, if you live in Texas, you live with ERCOT's grid. And as we enter the second summer after that incident, we're still dealing with the threat of rolling blackouts and shutdowns and failures. Why? Because the equipment is old. And there's a bunch of politics and money exchanging hands. That's too much to get into with this video. But Texas isn't alone when it comes to concerns about the power grid because the use of electricity all across the country is on the rise. You know, the more we turn away from fossil fuels and toward electricity to power our homes, the power grid's gonna continue to be pushed to the limit. So one thing a lot of people are talking about right now is a heat pump, which basically moves heat from a cool space to a warm space. So the pump makes the cool space cooler and the warm space warmer. Keep hot, hot, keep cool, cool. Basically it transfers heat instead of generating it. The Netherlands government is on board, banning fossil fuel heating by 2026 and mandating the use of a hybrid heat pump. The government said this could lead to a savings average of 60% on natural gas consumption. But even still, these heat pumps run on electricity. So yeah, I'll ask it again. How did they do this before electricity? People lived in uncomfortable climates and places for a long time. Were they just miserable? No, they weren't miserable. They were clever. And they devised some really interesting ways of, of living comfortably, really simple ways. Some of these are really cool. Let's start with wind catchers. The city of Yaz in central Iran has the most wind catchers in the world. The city also includes other heat beating structures like an underground refrigeration structure called a yakchal and an underground irrigation system called kanats. Wind catchers are often rectangular but can be circular, octagonal, square, or other shapes. Here's how they work. Two main forces drive air through and down into the housing structure. These are the incoming wind and the change in the air's buoyancy, depending on the temperature. The wind catcher catches the air, funnels it down into the dwelling below, and then deposits any debris or sand at the tower's foot. It then flows throughout the structure's interior, sometimes over subterranean water pools for further cooling. Warmed air eventually rises and leaves the tower through another tower or opening, aided by the pressure in the structure. According to researchers, using wind to cool structures goes all the way back to Egypt about 3,000 years ago. There, the structures had thick walls, few windows that faced the sun, and openings that let the wind in and out. In the desert regions of North America, Native Americans would either live in caves or build homes with thick adobe walls up against the sides of mountains to stay cool. On the flip side of that, the Inuit people would construct igloos to stay warm in the Arctic regions. Igloos stay warm because the snow walls are good insulators. These help keep in body heat and the generated heat by oil lamps that the Inuit use for cooking and socializing. And traditional igloos are usually made out of snow since solid ice doesn't retain heat as well as compressed snow. And the Inuit would usually keep on their fur-lined clothes while they were inside the igloo during the day, and then at night they would sleep in, wrapped in heavy furs to stay warm. So yeah, for thousands of years, people figured out ways to stay cool or stay warm without the need for electricity. Now, I know electricity is great. It's brought us a lot of wonderful things. None of us want to live without it. But what if you could slash your home's use of it by up to 90% and still be comfortable? That's the idea behind passive housing. Now, while the word housing is in the phrase, uh, the concept can apply to a variety of structures, apartment buildings, industrial facilities, retail stores, schools, etc. In fact, passive housing works better for larger structures because they have more efficient geometries. As a structure gets bigger, the ratio of its surface area to volume decreases, and this increases its efficiency. Now, there are two different and independent passive house certifications and standards. There's a German-based Passive House Institute that administers one, and the U.S.-based Passive House Institute that administers the other. 
But don't be confused, the Passive House Institute has nothing to do with the Passive House Institute. They're, they're two different things. Each group offers certifications, net zero options, and a retrofit certification. Both also have standards that are grounded in building science and physics, require practitioners to use a common suite of design principles to achieve targets, and focus on three performance metrics. Those metrics are building air tightness, thermal energy demand, and total energy demand. The main difference between the two standards comes down to performance targets based on the climate of the project's site. For example, PHI has the same cooling and heating load demand criteria for climates around the world, except for a dehumidification demand that's dependent on climate. But PHI US has climate-specific targets that are tailored to their locales. There are five fundamental design principles behind passive housing, including airtight construction, continuous insulation, filtered fresh air with heat recovery, high-performance doors and windows, and thermal bridge-free design. And these are followed by five secondary principles, including building orientation, daylighting and solar gain, efficient water heating and distribution, moisture management, and shading. Now, saving electricity isn't the only benefit to all this. There's also a lot of it that comes down to filtered airflow. And they do this through balanced ventilation systems, which don't just keep the house cool, it also prevents mold and mildew from arising. Passive housing structures are also quiet, have no dust, keep bugs outside, eliminate moisture and odors, are durable, and are more affordable in the long run. Here in Dallas, the first passive house went on the market in 2018. It was a 300 square meter home with two levels. It also had a water harvesting system and 4.8 kilometers of buried tubes in the yard that acted as an irrigation soaker system with no roll off. The house was pre-wired for solar panels and it made use of smart technology to control household functions. So yeah, passive houses, pretty cool. Um, there are some disadvantages though. The main one is probably the upfront cost, which can be 20 to 30% higher than traditional construction. Although ideally you would make that cost back in the savings and electrical bills over a few years. And passive housing construction can also be challenging in places with really hot summers or really cold winters. In fact, for a lot of places, probably Dallas included, it might be necessary to have a backup cooling and heating system. Uh, builders may also need to have lots of insulation to stay below the limit of 15 kilowatt hours per year. Window areas may be limited because they required energy performance standards. Also, those windows used have to be a low E coating and triple glazing, which is more expensive. Now, another thing to consider is whether or not a passive house will retain its value. Um, local property values and politics need to be thought of as well. You know, for some locations, having a passive house would be super cool, super hot. Hot and cool, whatever. But, you know, other places might not really care about it. They might be indifferent or even show contempt for these types of houses. But if you are interested in designing a new home or retrofitting an old home to conform with passive house ideologies, um, I'll put some links to some places down below that can at least get you started. Maybe you can even find somebody in your neck of the woods that can help you out. Now, before we go, um, another little thing that's interesting to talk about in terms of like how we can passively cool and heat structures uh, is biomimicry. I talked about biomimicry a while back. Um, it's basically taking design principles from nature. So one place that might be a good example of it is the Eastgate Center in Harare, Zimbabwe. Designed by architect Mick Pierce, the country's largest office and shopping complex has no conventional air conditioning or heating. But still, it stays a consistent temperature year round. And that's because its design was inspired by termite mounds. Okay, so here's the deal. Termite mounds have tiny holes in them, and this basically allows the air to flow through it freely. Uh, it basically operates like a lung. It just inhales and exhales throughout the day as the temperature rises and falls. And the Eastgate Center works in the same way. Outside air is drawn in through low-powered fans, and that air is then cooled or warmed by the building's mass, depending on the temperature of either the concrete or the air. This air is then vented through the building's floors and offices before leaving through chimneys at the top. And Pierce included jagged stone on the building's facade that's meant to sort of emulate cactus prickles. This isn't just a design thing, it turns out that pointy surfaces have greater surface area than flat ones, so they absorb less heat. And they also radiate that heat out more easily, keeping the building cooler. And because of all this, the building can stay between 28 degrees Celsius during the day and 14 degrees Celsius at night. And it does all of this using less than 35% of the energy of similar buildings in the country. It literally doesn't have an air conditioning system. And because of that, the building's owners have saved at least $3.5 million and the tenants' rents are 20% lower than the other buildings in the area. Another example of a building taking its cues from nature to help stay naturally cool or warm is the Gherkin in London. This was designed by Norman Foster based on sea anemones and sponges. The building's cylindrical shape allows wind to flow quickly around it and drive wind through the structure's center to keep it cool. Then you have the Spring Mountains Visitor Gateway in the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest Headquarters in Nevada. This structure uses several biomimetic elements in its design, like highly efficient radiant heating tubes that move cool and warm liquid to different areas of the building, which is similar to the ears of the black-tailed jackrabbit. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Jackrabbits have gigantic ears, and they use these huge ears to pump blood through and help cool them off. And this works on the same principle. So I get into this because I think it's really cool, you know, just using nature to find simple solutions. But it's also really important. 
According to the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, we might be running into some problems pretty soon. They released their summer reliability assessment for 2022 in May, and it warned of a high risk of failure throughout the Midwest, while Texas and the Western U.S. are at an elevated risk. According to the NERC director John Mora, quote, It's a sobering report. It's clear the risks are spreading, and the pace of our grid transformation is a bit out of sync with the underlying realities and the physics of the system. It's a warning we should probably pay attention to, because this problem is only going to get worse. Humans live for thousands of years without electricity by being clever. Let's face it, we've gotten kind of lazy over the last hundred years. But we seem to be making our way back to clever. Heat pumps are all the rage right now, they're pretty clever. So it'll be interesting to see how far our cleverness can take us. So people ask me all the time, like, what's the best way to support the channel, you know, between, say, Patreon or channel memberships or, or just watching the ads and that kind of thing. And honestly, I think the best way to support the channel is to support our sponsors. Because when you sign up for a sponsor, it kind of increases the value of the channel and that kind of lifts everything. And that's especially true for today's sponsor, because I kind of helped build today's sponsor. Um, anyway, I'm talking about Nebula. So you've heard me talk about Nebula for a while now. It's usually paired with the Curiosity Stream Bundle, but today I just want to talk about Nebula classes. You know those um, other platforms where famous people teach you how to do what they do? Well, have you ever wondered what it would be like if classes were taught by your favorite YouTubers? Because that's exactly what Nebula Classes is. Yeah, we've been working on this thing for well over a year now. It just recently launched. It's the biggest expansion of Nebula so far, and we're all really excited about it. The classes are super high quality. They're shot at the Nebula Studios in New York, and in them you can learn about music production from Amy Nolte, video animation from Volksgeist, architecture from Bright Trip, communication techniques from Windover Productions, there's business classes, tech classes, mental health classes. You can even learn how to sue like a lawyer with Legal Eagle. He will not teach you how to get such an impressive jawline. I keep asking, he won't tell me. Anyway, they're releasing a new class every week. There's already a pretty impressive library on there. And there are also Nebula Talks, which are kind of like TED Talks from your favorite creators. I've actually got one that just launched. It's about how manifesting is bullshit. But it still kind of works. Basically, I talk about how you can sort of hack your brain to find opportunities that can get you closer to the dream life you've always wanted. It kind of takes the woo-woo out of the whole thing and shows how some of the practices involved in manifesting are still pretty helpful. So watch my talk and you'll learn how to manifest a passive house. It, it doesn't work that way, but I think it's interesting and I hope you like it. Nebula classes are on top of the regular Nebula subscription that gives you access to all of our content early and ad-free, including Nebula originals that you can't find anywhere else. If you're already subscribed there, it's $5 a month. If you're not already subscribed, it's $8 a month for the whole thing. Nebula classes, Nebula originals, Nebula everything. Or if you're feeling saucy, it's $80 for the whole year, so basically two months free. So if you're interested, just go to nebulaclasses.com slash Joe Scott and it's all yours, the, the whole kingdom. Um, no, it, it really is the best way to support this channel or any creators that you might follow that are on there. You know, uh, having our own platform outside of YouTube is just a nice little fail safe because, well, you never know. Anyway, it's nebulaclasses.com slash Joe Scott. Links down below. Hope you enjoy it. Big thanks to the Answer Files, the Patreon supporters that help keep this channel afloat. They're forming an awesome community. I cannot thank you guys enough. Uh, I got some names to shout out real quick. We've got Kelly Woody. Bum Bum McPoopy Fart Face. Congratulations, you got me to say it. JB Funk, James Preezing, George Branca, John Engel, uh, Johnny Sibley, Jim Caulfield, Passion, George Shaharabazid, <laughs> and Edgar Siskevevis. Siskevevis, yeah. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and access to live streams uh, that are exclusive to Patreon and members only, just go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out because Google thinks you'll like that one. Or look at any of them over here on the sidebar that have my face on them. And uh, yeah, give them a look. If you like them, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.